I don't know what it is about resolutions, but I think everybody knows the joke is you make them and you never keep them. I think the average is like two to three weeks max that people are going to make a resolution and actually keep it two to three weeks max. That's why I want to take advantage of that. I'm always thinking. I'm always wanting to take advantage of those opportunities. So I'm going to start a gymnasium called the Resolution Solution. Just the name is catchy, and I think people are going to like it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to rent a warehouse for three weeks and fill it full of uh, workout equipment. And I'm only going to rent the equipment and rent the space for three weeks. Then I'm going to get people to join the gym at the beginning of the year for a New Year's resolution. And then for three weeks, they'll work out. And when they stop showing up, I'm going to pull out. I'm going to take all my stuff. And then they're going to have paid the, the year-long membership. And I'm going to make some money while not having to have all of that workout equipment in there. It's called the resolution solution trademark. Don't try to take that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. People don't tend to stick to the resolutions. What is it about resolutions that people don't, why don't they keep them? I don't know what it is. I was reading some stuff in the uh, Harvard Business Review, just talking about different ways. One person said, well, it's because you're too goal-focused and you're not, you know, you, you don't allow for any wiggle room. And then another article said, no, it's because you're not goal-focused enough and you, you leave too much wiggle room. And so it never seems to be that there is an answer to why we don't keep our resolutions. And the resolutions, they're all typical, right? Uh, I want to lose weight. I want to work out more. I want to read more. I want to travel more, except if you're me, I want to travel less. That's always my resolution. I want to travel less in 2017. People want to travel. One such person who did travel was a, na a man named Frank Abagnale. You guys know that name? Frank Abagnale. If you've seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, it's the movie about a real-life man named Frank Abagnale. And he was a guy who did travel a lot, and it wasn't always on the up and up on how he traveled. In fact, this guy was one who got himself on planes and all these different, ways, all these different uh, travel means by simply faking to be an airline pilot. And he, he was forging checks all over the place. He was doing things that were against the law, and because of that, the law was constantly against Frank Abagnale. Until it came to a point in time where the law actually caught up to him and charged him as a criminal, and he was condemned. But did you know the story of Frank Abagnale's life after that? After he paid his debt to society, after the justice had been served for the crimes he had committed, he actually joined the law and started to uphold the law and started to persecute and prosecute people who were forging checks like he was. He worked for the government now. It's just an interesting change with that guy right there. Now, if you think about that, that's a lot like the law in the life of a Christian. See, before you become a Christian, the law to you is nothing but condemnation. The law just accuses you, and it shows that you're guilty all the time. But after you become saved, because justice has been served, not because you served it, but because Christ did on the cross, now the law becomes something different to you. You uphold it. You love it. You long for it, as the psalmist does in Psalm 119. See, what we're going to look today is about resolution strategies, about loving the Word of God all in 2017. How do you do that? Well, flip open your Bibles to Psalm 119, verse 33. And we're going to find out what it means to love the law of God, how we can make these resolutions to study the Bible in 2017, make sure we keep those. And I think uh, there's two strategies, especially in this psalm, that are going to help us. Psalm 119, verse 33 through 40. It's the longest psalm in the Psalter, 176 verses, an acrostic psalm, which means it's probably used to aid in memorizing the psalm. Each verse, that out of the 22 sections of the Hebrew alphabet, each section, each of the verses begins with the letter of the alphabet right there. So Aleph, the A letter for the beginning, eight verses, they all begin with that letter so that people are going to remember this because it's important to have the right mindset of what the, the Word of God is because the Word of God is how we gain knowledge of God. And when we grow in the knowledge of God, that's when we will grow in our love for God. That's what 2017 should be about for you. We can make resolutions about losing weight, reading more, traveling more. All of those things would be fine in and of themselves. But if we don't get this one resolution right, growing in our love and knowledge of God, then what would this be? All of these would be meaningless. We want to make sure we, we study the Bible and we study it well in 2017. Take a look at verse 33. Listen to this. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. 
Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. See, I think we have two strategies in here that are going to be very helpful for you developing in your knowledge of God and keeping your resolution to study the Bible more. And it's when, number one, we increase in our knowledge of the Bible. That's number one. That's, that's the way that you are going to grow in your love for God. And the way you're going to keep your resolution is when you grow in knowledge of the Bible. When you begin to study the Bible, and we need to grow in the knowledge of, of, the, of our study of the Bible, when you begin to do that, you're going to watch this resolution to read the Bible through in a year or memorize a certain amount of verses, you're going to watch that take off when you say, I need to develop in my understanding of the Bible. Because like I said, all of Psalm 119 is about how much the psalmist loves the word of God, or as he calls it, the law of God. And the law of God being here, not just specific commandments or even just the first five books of the Bible, but just the entirety of the revelation of God to his people so that they might know him. God wants us to know him so much that he's communicated to us his word so that we should study it and know him and love him more. And in 2017, it would be nothing better for you to make a resolution to say, I'm going to grow my knowledge of the Bible. How do we do that? Well, I think the first three verses give us two specific ways on how we're going to grow in our knowledge of the Bible. Number one, we need to pray boldly for it, okay? That's letter A underneath number one. Pray boldly for it. If you had the time... Go through Psalm 119 and just read it. It's, it's basically a prayer of the psalmist to God to say, God, I want to know you through your word. And when we begin to co combine two things that are, should be standard in the life of a Christian, prayer and Bible study, when we combine those two things, we really have a force that's going to help us grow like we've never grown before. And did you catch the way that the psalmist was talking to God? I mean, as I was studying it this week, this is, it gets uncomfortable to start to read this. Because as I'm looking at this in the original language, I'm checking out the Hebrew, these are commands, and it's not from God to the psalmist. These are commands from the psalmist to God. Let that sink in. The psalmist is going to God and saying, God, teach me, give me understanding, lead me. These are bold prayer requests from the psalmist to God because he wants God to give him knowledge of his word. How can he do this? Let's just talk about that. When you have a strong relationship with someone, that can handle bold requests. It can handle strange and bizarre requests, okay? I don't have, I don't have any girls. We have four boys, okay? I don't have any girls. But I'm told by dads that have daughters that there is a regular request for the daughter to paint daddy's nails. Is that true? Has any dad experienced that out there with dads with daughters? They're not willing to admit it in a room like this. Now, see, we got one. You don't have a kid? This is going to be a weird conversation. It does happen a lot. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it does happen a lot. You make those types of requests, right? You think about that, that the daughter would go to dad and say, Dad, give me your hand. I want to paint your nails. And you know what? The dad might play along and let the daughter do that because of that special relationship, right? You can make that bold command when there's that close relationship. For, for sons, we don't, we don't have painting nails. <laughs> the only thing I can think of was, have you heard of this game, Pie in the Face? Uh, it's, it's a game created by people who hate parents. It's literally the worst game. It's just whipped cream being shoved in your face. And to be honest, if any of you came up to me and said, Pastor Elliot, can I shove whipped cream in your face? I would say, absolutely not. But you know what? My six-year-old Miles, who got pie in the face for Christmas, if he comes up to me and says, Dad, I want to I shove a pie in your face. Let's play pie in the face. He's going to make that bold request. And you know what? Because of that relationship, I'm going to do it. Because I love my son. We have that close relationship. Well, it's kind of like that with us in the Bible, right, and God. God has that close relationship to us. When we start to ask things according to God's will, we can make these bold requests because of that special relationship, that covenantal bond that we have with God. But watch it go one step further. When my will and my Father's will line up, that's when we can make really bold requests. Turn with me to John 14 just to see this. John 14. Just to get this in your mindset, this is Jesus talking about the boldness of our prayer request. John 14, take a look at verses, I think it's 11, John 14, 11 through 15. 
This is Jesus here in the upper room discourse talking to his disciples. He's saying things to them that this is basically the last instructions he's going to give to them before he goes to the cross. So it's highly important on what he says. Look at verse uh, 12 of John 14. Verse 12 of John 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And right there, we have some bold prayer requests, but they are, they are sanctioned in, they are blocked in by these two caveats, that it's in the name of the Son and it's for the glory of the Father. And we start to think about that, that guides the way that we pray. I'm going to make bold requests to God as long as they are in line with the will of God and the glory of God. And when you have that as your heart motivation and desire, then you go to God and you proclaim to him, God, I want this. And he's ready and willing to answer that because it's in line with his will. Think about this, you know, my son Miles, okay? Unfortunately, I have just realized I've made a horrible decision in being a Rams fan. Like, it's just, it's dumb. Like, I wish they'd go back to St. Louis so I could stop cheering for them. I mean, what happened? We were like three and one at one point in time, and now we're four and ten. Jared Goff is playing like my grandmother. Um, uh, my grandmother's not good at football, just so you know that, just so you understand the comparison there. It's just a bad time to be a Rams fan. But let's just say it turns around, and in the future, my will is to cheer for the Rams and they do well, and let's say it's my son's will to do that. Let's say they make it all the way to the Super Bowl, and I promise my son, Miles, if the Rams ever make it to the Super Bowl, I will buy you tickets. I'll give you the money to buy tickets to the Super Bowl. So I've made a promise, and I've told him my will. If the Rams make it to the Super Bowl, you know what I want my son to do? I want him to come to me and say, Dad, give me the money that you promised according to your will and what you want and what I want. I want you to give me that so I can go purchase what you promised. It's like that with us and God. There is a promise he's given to us. He wants us to know him and to glorify him. So when you go to God and say, God, give me this that I may glorify your name, God is ready and willing to do that. Go back to Psalm 119. Just listen to these commands from the psalmist to God. Teach me. Does God desire to be known? Absolutely. That is his mission in the Bible. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, the mighty man boast in his might, the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord. Paul quotes that 1 Corinthians 1, God wants to be known. So when you go to God and boldly proclaim, God, from your word, teach me who you are, you make that boldly. Because God wants to do that. Because when you know him, you will glorify him more. That's the point of salvation, John 17, 3, right? This is salvation. This is eternal life. That you know me and my son, Jesus Christ. It's about the knowledge of God. So in 2017, if you want to see your Bible knowledge grow, and you want to see this resolution that you have to continue to study the Bible, it will be only when you match it with the prayer, God, teach me. God, you must instruct me. Help me to know what your, your Bible says so I can know you. Look, he's not just, it's not just teaching. It's not just intellectual knowledge. Give me understanding. Another command, a causative command saying, God, you must do this for me. Give me understanding. It's not just about factual knowledge. It's like a difference between you know, reading about changing the oil in your car and knowing the facts and like an understanding of having somebody take you out and teaching you how to do it. There's a difference in the knowledge, and it's not just factual, it's an understanding that I know what your word says. And finally, it says, lead me in these paths. I want you to be my guide, Father. You must navigate me through your word. For us as Christians, it's the Holy Spirit that does that for us. We depend on the Spirit of God to lead us through the word of God, to conform us to the image of the Son of God, all for the honor and glory of God. That's what should be our aim in 2017. But it's not just by boldly proclaiming. You know what it is? It's also by applying the word of God. You want to know why a lot of people don't keep up their daily Bible reading? Because they don't apply what they learn. They don't read it and then go out and live it. I mean, that's what James says, right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only. 
Because in the doing, you will be blessed when you go to the word of God and you say, God, I am your child by the grace of God. What Jesus has done for me on the cross, that means I am yours. Now I've got to go out and live this. You know why you don't usually keep up in those Bible reading programs? Because you're not applying what you're learning. But when you start to apply it and you see it transform your life, well, now you have more motivation to continue to do this. Watch, watch how the psalmist says that. Verse 33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes and... I will keep it to the end. Do you see the practical aspect of that right there? Teach me so that I can persevere in my obedience to you. Teach me so that I continue to follow what you have instructed me to do. Give me understanding that I may keep your law. And watch this phrase, observe it with my whole heart. See, this is how we know when we read this portion, and we're talking about the law of God, this is not a legalistic, like, I'm going to do this to earn it from God. I'm keeping this from my whole heart. And the whole heart change has to come from the Father in the new covenant giving us a new heart. This is New Testament language, essentially, matching the Old Testament promise that God will circumcise the heart of his people, put the law on their hearts, so that when you observe the rules and commands of God, it's, it's from a genuine heart desire. Just write down Romans 6, 17. Romans 6, 17, and you will understand what this phrase is mean, Romans 6, 17 says this, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin are now slaves of righteousness. You as a Christian, that is, that is your designation. You are becoming obedient from the heart. This is not mere external performance. This is an internal reality being thrust outward because God is at work in your life. You better start applying what you learn. And when you guys, guys, when you do this, and you just pray, read your Bible, and apply, you're going to start to find that motivation that's going to sustain you through 2017. See, the only problem is, this isn't, this isn't flashy, okay? This isn't something new. This is just ordinary, quote-unquote, Christian life. But I believe the old adage is true that those people who do ordinary things extraordinary well will excel you know, this isn't flashy, but you know what? To be honest, like when you want something that is worthwhile and durable and stable, it never is flashy. Who out there remembers the phone, the Nokia 3310? Raise your hand. If you, if you think of that in the mind, it's that little blue phone. It had snake on it. That's how you remember that one. It had snake, the game on it. If, if you don't remember it, go YouTube it today and watch people drop it from six feet onto the ground survives the fall, you put it together, and it works like a charm. See, durability isn't flashy, but it always is there when you need it. It's the same thing with the Christian life. We, you know, we're looking for the iPhone solution to the Christian life. What's the new flashy thing that's coming out? What's the new phone that's coming out? What's the new thing that's coming out? And then every time that you have that and you need it, you drop it in, the screen cracks. Or like for me, like you unplug it from a battery charge, you play a game, and then you have to go find a charger again just to charge the phone. You go to that Nokia phone, you could charge it for like three years, okay? Never need to recharge the battery again. <laughs> There's some, even some jokes that are so funny. It says, you know, you drop an iPhone, you're worried that it's going to crack the iPhone screen. You drop one of those Nokia phones, you're worried that it's going to crack the cement because it's so durable. Listen, durability isn't flashy, but it's what you want in the Christian life. This is just, this is every day what we need to be doing Going to the Bible, being fed, strengthened, encouraged to go out and live for God. If God wants us to know him and then go out in the world and make him known, how can we do that unless we know the Bible? Because we've got to grow in that. And we cannot, at any point in time, stop applying these things. But don't think for a moment, I know this sounds like there's a lot of effort, and there is. Like there's, This just takes effort to do this, guys. It takes it takes strength and striving to do this. But you know what? It's, it's not bleak. Look where the psalmist goes from here. Lead me in the path of your commands, verse 35, for I delight in them. Guys, I'm telling you that when you aggressively pursue this, you will now start to delight in the Bible like you never have before. Just watch this. Just go to Genesis 1.1, okay? Okay? Find the book of contents and go a little bit to the right, okay? Genesis, okay, Genesis 1-1. If you do the daily Bible reading with us, this is what you are going to find. You're going to start today, Genesis 1-1. You're 
you're going to read this phrase in the Bible. Watch, look at these words right here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, the rest of this revelation is miraculous. That the God who created everything simply by speaking it into being is about to make himself known through the next 66 books of the Bible. And you will get to know that God who speaks things into existence simply by reading his word. What more could be a delight to a being created in the image of God who's designed to glorify God than finding more out about this God? It will be your delight in 2017. When you start to do the, the prayer thing, and you start to do the application thing, and you start to join those together in a community of people, there will be the sense of joy like we're studying in Philippians that can't be taken from you because it's God speaking to you and he designed you a certain way to do a certain thing to glorify him. You will do that when you know him, when you understand him. You'll just delight in all that he has for you. Psalm, I think it's 112 verse 1. Uh, Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. It's a delight to you. You will find joy in this. But the psalmist back in Psalm 1933, uh, 36, he anticipates something. It's very helpful here. Something that I think you and I really need to understand. This is going to be this, the second way that we're going to continue this motivation. It's when we avoid distractions. We need to avoid distractions. It's number two on your outline. The psalmist understands that if I'm going to grow in my knowledge of the Bible, I've got to pray. I've got to boldly pray. Like Hebrews says, boldly approach the throne of grace. I've got to do that. Then I've got to apply what the Bible says. But when I avoid distractions, it allows me to have that full delight in the Bible. Now, now watch this transition from verse 35 to 36. 35, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Verse 36, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Now, why would the psalmist need to pray, incline my heart, God? I mean, he's just said, the word of God is my delight, right? The word of God is where I find joy. Why does God need to, to bend his heart, maybe another translation, or uh, make his heart more loyal to the word of God? Why does he need to do that if he finds delight in it? Because the psalmist understands this, that distractions abound in the world we live in. See, we read Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God creates everything, man rebels, sin enters the world, death through sin, Romans chapter 5, and now we have things that originally were designed to point to God and to give God attention, and now those things are trying to steal your attention away from God. We gotta avoid those distractions, okay? Take a look at some of these distractions. What does he list here? Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Now think about that. The Bible's not against gaining things, okay? Let's, let's make that clear. The Bible's not against wealth, per se, in and of itself. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil, right? This is selfish gain. This is what the Bible would say would be a distraction to you. That money would become such an object to you that you would do unlawful and unjust things to get that money, and that would steal your focus. And we live in such a society that you don't have to do something illegal to do something that I would consider ungodly and unjust to make money. It's just simply being a workaholic. Like you could be so obsessed with money that you legally are not doing anything wrong, but you are stealing from God as he's giving you a responsibility in a family or responsibility at church or responsibility in a community to make him known that if you're so devoted to those things, there's no way you're going to keep up in the Bible reading because what you value most is money. You see, it would be so helpful for you just to read Psalm 119. I think it's like five or six times in the psalm he compares the word of God to being better than silver or gold. He's like, he says, uh, finding your word is like finding a great spoil. It's like finding treasure. And when your heart is so enraptured with the Bible that way, that's not to say you have to quit your job and only study the Bible. Now you can rightly enjoy your job, and now you're going to put it right in its priority chart underneath the knowledge of God and serving other people. You will use that as a function and a tool to glorify God rather than a trophy lifted up to steal his glory, we got to watch that. You will never persist in any sort of Bible reading, understanding of God, if selfish gain is what is driving you. It'd be great for you, we don't have time, look at 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 10. It says this phrase, but godliness with contentment is great gain. 
Think about that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. You want the gain that the Bible's promising, it will be when you are putting rightly God, your relationship to him, your service to other people. That's when you're going to find the right gain. Okay, Lay up not treasures here on earth, but treasures in heaven is what we want to be doing. Don't get distracted by money. What else? Look at verse 37. This is helpful. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. That's an incredible prayer right there. Just think about that. When was the last time you prayed something like that? I mean, we just have distractions everywhere, okay? <laughs> like, we have, like, Netflix, which is the biggest distraction that there is. And this is not a rally against Netflix. You know, I, I watch Netflix. I like Netflix. It's fun to watch movies with your family. It's fun to not have a million DVDs because you want to watch, a, you know, the full show of something. You get to watch it. It's, it's a good thing to have. But if you abuse it, it becomes a worthless thing that steals your attention. In fact, Netflix, like, mocks you at times. Have you ever been, like, watching, like, three episodes, and then afterwards it says, are you still watching this? <laughs> like, Netflix itself is looking at you like, you're wasting your time. Are you still watching this? this? This can't be real. We need to watch what we're putting in front of our eyes because if you read Psalm 119, the eyes become such an important component in you understanding God. Look at Psalm 119, verse 6. Psalm 119, verse 6. Just watch how important the eyes are. Start in verse 4. Psalm 119, 4. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways would be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Verse 6. Then I shall not be put to shame, having fixed my eyes on all your commandments. You want a great resolution for 2017? There it is. My eyes are fixed on your word. What you command, I want to do because I know that's where I find joy. I know that I'm going to be able to prioritize everything correctly because in it I'm going to be thinking of the glory of God and the good of others if I have my eyes fixed on your word. Take a look at verse 15. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on all your ways. The psalmist is saying, I'm going to do this. But we have in our verse and in verse 18, take a look at verse 18, another prayer request from the psalmist. Open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. Well, that's back to point number one. When's the last time, when's the last time you prayed that? That you, you simply just started your Bible study saying, God, show me something wonderful today. I, I love, as a pastor, it's, it's really a privilege to pray with people. It really is. I can think of people from Aliso Viejo that, I, you know, specific spots that, that they came into my office and prayed or we prayed outside. I just, I love to pray with people. But I think I could count on one hand the amount of times that that prayer request was, Pastor, just pray that I know the Bible better. It, it's not wrong to pray for these other things. In a few weeks, we're going to study Philippians 4. We need to pray about everything. That is absolutely true. But just write out your prayer list and say, how much am I praying for physical things? And how often have I said, God, just let me know you better. Help me to understand your word. I need you to open my eyes. I need you to teach me. I need you to give me understanding. If you have on the back of your worksheet, you have question number four is I'd like you just at least for the month of January to pick two verses out of Psalm 119. And at the beginning of your Bible study time, pray one of them. And at the end of your Bible study time, pray the other one. And that is going to hopefully keep your mindset and saying, God, I need you to help me or else this is going to be all for naught. I'm going to make sure that we're doing this with prayer. Worthless things. I love that description. It goes back to what you value. What do you honestly value? Because you know, implicitly, we do what we value most. If you value comfort, you will make yourself comfortable, even if you don't explicitly say that. That's why resolutions are so great, because it should be the explicit uh, communication of our internal desires. But you're always doing what you value most. He's saying, don't devote yourself to something that is worth less. When we can look at the scriptures and devote ourselves to finding out how worthy God is. And that, that's a pursuit of 2017. That's what we need to be about. Look at verse, uh, back in Psalm 19, look at verse 30, 39. So many distractions, worthless things, money. But this one might hit closer to home for some of you. Turn away the reproach that I dread, verse 39, for your rules are good. 
See, there's a distraction that will come into your Bible study, and this will stop you from making any sort of headway or progress in what it means to know God and study God in 2017. And it will be when mockery comes from other people. Sometimes this word for the reproach that I dread is used of God disciplining his people, but I don't think this is God doing it. I genuinely think this is people that are beginning to mock the psalmist because now he's adopting what the Bible says. And when that mockery and that scorn comes, doesn't that sometimes tempt you to stop pursuing God? I mean, this could come from a family member, a coworker, a friend. It could come from anybody. That mockery, that scorn sometimes stops your motivation for wanting to know God. You can't let that happen. And did you see the contrast? God, let me not listen to the mockery because your word is good. The commandments are good. When we follow God and we know God and we walk in his ways, there is goodness and mercy and blessing and peace that follow. But we get so caught up and we forget that when people mock us. You got to watch that. You read through Psalm 119, you'll over and over again see, princes persecute me, but I will not sway from your commandments. People scorn me, but I will not move from your word. Mockery will stop you. You got to pray, God, keep me from that. And I guess there's a number of different ways that God could answer this prayer request, but I was really thinking about this. Like, let's just say it's a coworker. Say, you have your cubicle, and you say, in 2017, I'm going to get to know God, and I put my Bible in there, and I read my Bible, and my coworker next to me, they just, they, they mock it. They say, that's stupid, that's foolish, why do you waste your time? And there's that. There's, there's two ways God can answer that prayer. One is that God, you know, could get the guy transferred. He gets transferred to another section of the branch. He gets transferred to another company. He gets transferred to another country. I don't, I don't know where you work. You know, it could, anything could happen, right? God could remove them physically. But you know what I think would give God more glory? Is if God just made you immune to their mockery. And you just stayed there. And you just took it and said, I, I really don't care what you say. What you say to me is worthless. What God says to me is worthy. His commandment is good. There's no way I'm going to let your mockery steal the goodness of God who is trying to bless me by knowing him. I think that that would give God a lot of glory. So consider praying that in 2017. When I, when I stand up, when I live for the word of God, let the mockery, I may not care. Let me be there to serve those people and show them what true joy and contentment is. I think it would be a great prayer request for you. You see, all of this culminates in verse 40. I love the beauty of this psalm. If you see verse 33 through verse 39, they all begin with that command. Do this, God. Do this, God. Do this, God. Over and over again. And then in verse 40, he says this, behold. Now, the author didn't have to put that in there. He could have just said the statement, I long for your precepts, and not said the word, behold. But he breaks that transition from command to command to command, and now he says, behold, because I think he wants you to stop. And realize what is said right here. I long for your precepts. You know what I think that is? I think that's the answer to the prayer for the entire psalm. This is showing you that when you do this, when you devote to doing what God wants you to do, behold, the psalmist now longs for God's commandments. Everything that he's asked for, he has been given. He wants you to stop and think about that. It reminds me of 1 John 3, 19 through 24. That if our heart condemns us, God is greater than God, and whatever we ask in his name, he will give to us because we do what is pleasing to him. We have that confidence. This is a confident assertion that God is going to answer these prayer requests from the heart of a believer who genuinely wants them. So guys, in 2017, let's make sure that these two strategies of knowing more about God and not getting distracted by things that are worthless will continue to guide us in our daily pursuit of who God is. I read a quote that I think was, was very insightful. It's by a, a man, a British author in the 19th century. His name was uh, Anthony Torpel or Torpel. I'm not sure how they pronounce, pronounce it. But he was an author, prolific writer. Uh, he revolutionized the postal system over there. Got a lot of work done. Listen to what he said. He said, a small daily task, if it be daily, will beat the labors of a spasmatic Hercules. Think about that. A small daily task, if it be daily, will beat the habits of a spasmatic Hercules. You, you, you're amped up today. You walk out and you say, I'm going to read the Bible by, by lunch, okay? I'm going to have the Bible read by lunch, and then tomorrow I'm going to read it backwards, okay? I'm going to get this done. 
That, not the way to approach this. Small, daily portions of the Bible throughout the day with other people is what's going to build up this love and strength and growth in God like you've never seen before. But you've got to devote to it daily. What did the, the psalmist say? Blessed is the man who doesn't hang with those people, but who meditates on your law day and night. Remember we talked about stability isn't flashy, but in the psalm, Psalm 1, psalm 1 verse 3, there's stability with that guy. He's like a tree planted by streams of water, produces fruit in season, and his leaf doesn't wither. You know, there's nothing fancy about the tree. It's just doing what it should be doing. You as a Christian should be producing that same fruit to the glory of God. It's not flashy. It's just doing what God's asked you to do. So in 2017, let's make that commitment. And I think it's going to be a year that God's going to do great things. Compass Bible Church, Tustin, let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, may we not be tricked to, to look into worthless things. God, that doesn't mean we have to shut our eyes and only focus on your word. But when we view this world through the lens of your scriptures, Father, now we rightly understand it. Now, as Ecclesiastes says, who can find enjoyment outside of God? We can't rightly enjoy the things that you've given us to enjoy unless we know you more. And then we will never do what you've designed us to do, which is to make you known throughout this world. God, we pray for the day when your son will come back and the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God like the sea covers the earth. But until then, God, may we go out and communicate that great truth because we love it and long for it. God, give us that daily commitment to be stable, durable people who know your word, who grow in your word, who desire, Father, to love you more. May we be impassioned, Father, as we pursue you for your honor and glory. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because we didn't come up with this revelation. God, you gave it to us. God, may we feed on it daily. May we be strengthened by it. May we be led by it, Father, in this dark world, all so that we might honor and glorify your great name. God, this will not be possible without you. We come to you asking that you would answer the promises that you've given us in the scriptures. And we pray this all in your son's wonderful name. Amen.